I also would like to thank the organizers very much for having invited me to this conference. Um, it motivated me to do some work which I really enjoyed. What I'm going to present is based on earlier work which I, I did about uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, but the results are basically uh, some follow-up which I did after the invitation. So how do I go to the next slide? Um, yes, please. Suppose. Here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, alcohol-conserved elements are a highly enigmatic phenomenon which has created uh, uh, quite a bit of excitement about uh, 20 years ago. It was the consequence of the complete genome sequencing of human and mouse and uh, uh, additional uh, vertebrate genomes. So this led to the discovery of DNA regions which were 100% identical between human, rat and mouse. That was reported in the seminal Bejerano paper. Now, why was this uh, such a big surprise? Uh, it was a big surprise because millions of base pairs of, of mouse and human sequences have already been sequenced before. And these regions has been selected be because people thought they of some interest. And then when uh, the initiative start started to, to sequence the entire genome, there was some hope to discover something truly new, but overall it was more a kind of finishing the job perspective that people had, but then suddenly these sequences were discovered. And nobody had any idea what they would do. Nobody figured out why nobody came across these uh, regions. I mean, no, no genetic disease was linked to this. And so, this, the, it, as I said, it created excitement. Now, just to, to give, a more, give you a more specific, so it's, it's really a tiny fraction of mammalian genomes. It's only par, about uh, 0.05% of the human genome. It's, in these early studies, it was mostly non-coding. There were very few exceptions of, of coding regions. Today, most people do not consider these uh, coding examples as uh, part of the same club of ultra-conserved sequences. Now, most of these uh, regions were also uh, highly conserved in chicken, over 95%. I think a majority was found in fish, fishes, and really nobody had an idea why 100% sequence identity was required uh, over such long periods. So basically, very few facts. Uh, I even don't really uh, have a good idea what to summarize. Uh, and of course, lots of beliefs and speculations. So my, my speculation is that these UCNEs are responsible for, precise, uh, for the precise execution of complex developmental programs or other complex programs. And a more molecular view is that the UCNEs are cis-acting transcriptional regulators of master regulatory genes. So I think both kind of uh, uh, hold up to now. Now, just there is, there is no uh, common uh, language, no common definition names and resources, but everybody feels we are talking about the same phenomenon. So the initial definition was 100% uh, uh, over 200 base pairs, in room and mouse rat. Then uh, some of these regions were tested in a reported gene assay in mouse embryos and were shown to drive tissue-specific expression. So they were uh, published in, in form of a, of a database with a visual interface 
uh, called Vista. Another group focused on longer evolutionary distance, mostly uh, uh, fish uh, mammal comparisons, and they used an approach based on multiple sequence alignment. And my group, uh, I together with a PhD student, Slavica Dimitrieva, uh, compiled uh, UCN eBay's uh, a collection which is based on human chicken elements that have at least 95% identity and 100 uh, base pair in length. The nomenclature is also variable, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. There is, most people would agree, there's a continuum between just highly conserved uh, elements and ultra-conserved elements, but also most people would agree that we see trends. For instance, that if we go to the highly conserved elements, then we see a higher enrichment in genes of certain classes and the like. So ju just uh, we, the, these are the elements, uh, how they are shown in a, in a genome browser. You see the elements from, from uh, uh, four different source, sources. You see they're somewhat different in size. But overall, there is a, a good correspondence. But just to remind you, we, we are not a, talking about elements like an exon of a protein coding genes. There is some uh, debate where the element starts, where the element ends, and whether two elements which are very close would actually be considered one. Or more. You see on this slide also lower you see the vertebrate conservation track and all these elements fall into regions which are at maximum in this track but if you low, look further below you see that actually only the ones uh, which uh, correspond to UCNEs are also conserved in Xenopus and zebrafish. Obviously, this is not true for the coding parts. You know, in the coding parts, you also see conservation, but based on the color, weaker conservation. So there are some remarkable differences in evolution compared to coding regions. So there's higher sequence conservation, but you could argue we know that the genetic code is degenerate and, and this inevitably leads to some tolerance uh, with regard to, to, to base substitutions. Now the, UC, the human UCSEs re, are restricted to vertebrates. This doesn't mean that U, UCNEs may not exist in other clades, but you never find similarity between a human UCNE and one in another uh, Phylum. Now, some of the UCNEs are very old, so there, there is 95% conser conservation between human and shark, which uh, means uh, a billion years of evolution. And a very interesting phenomenon is that they, they appear as clusters. So they are, they are very, they are strongly clusters. I will show this on the next slide. And what I also find very striking is there are no UCNE families and domains, and there are very few paralogs. So they tend to be unique, and ultra-conservation exists only between orthologous regions. The, the fact that we don't have domains which are reshuffled in, in various combinations, to me, has tells us something about the code in, in which these uh, elements are written. So maybe, uh, very speculative, the words are very short, in which case we wouldn't detect similarity. Protein domains are 100 amino acids. So these are just, uh, this is a figure uh, which shows you the, the, the positional correlation. So within a region of about one megabase, the probability to find another UCNEs is about tenfold, twelvefold increased. And this the, the areas are relatively big. It's, uh, it's in the order of one to two megabases, and some clusters are, are five megabases. This is another way of, of expressing the clustering. Look at the number. So nine genes uh, are associated with 10% of all UCNs. So that's, that's a, a strong imbalance. And only about 100 genes uh, make up uh, 50%.
So it's a, it's it's an unjust society. The super rich and and many no have anything. <coughs> Just pictures of clusters around key regulatory genes. You see again. You see there are many. You know as such clusters. They are called gene regulatory blocks. Uh, Genomic regulatory blocks, so they are, they, they have several hundred elements sometimes. And this is a, 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 a table which shows you the degree of, of enrichment of, uh, of, of certain uh, go terms. Uh, on the top, we, we find uh, genes that have been linked to brain function or to brain structure. And I, I, I should say my uh, view is a little bit unorthodox in that I, I put the focus on the brain. And most people active put the focus on development. So they were just, but I, I mean, brain also needs development. Uh, no. Okay, so this is a, a, a small side story. Basically, uh, uh, in order to exemplify that, the only way we can study actually these elements is by comparative genomics or evolutionary uh, arguments. So this is, um, uh, I mentioned that these gene regulatory blocks span large regions. I, I didn't explicitly mention that they often span multiple genes. In up to 10 genes. So then obviously the, the question arises, which gene do they control? Do they control all, all genes or maybe only one? And there is a, a group published this very elegant paper which exploited the fact that there was a whole genome duplication in fishes occurring about 300 million years ago. And after this whole genome duplications, in most cases, one copy of the genes got lost. Sometimes both were retained. So it was uh, logical to speculate, basically, we should look at the two copies in one of these fish species. And what, what you see is that, indeed, in fish, these gray elements outside the coding regions, which constitute the genomic regulatory block, they stay with one of the genes, with the green gene, and got completely, whereas in copy one, the, this brown orange gene disappeared completely, just got randomized away. And uh, so they, they concluded that this entire block controls the green gene. And then came the bombshell paper for the community, claiming that uh, deletion of a UCNE in a transgenic mouse, target deletion of a single UCNE, uh, yields viable mice and, and, and totally fertile viable, viable mice. And that was unexpected because most people associated high conservation with important function, essentiality. So it was, so why, why are they conserved if, if we can actually, or if mice can live and proliferate without such element? And this question has been unresolved for more than 10 years. Just. Now, I refer to this as the big paradox and just want to mention a few possible explanations, so which were uh, advanced. One is UCNEs are mutational cold spots. Uh, so basically, it is known that mutation rates are not constant over the genome. And so why not to speculate that there are regions of the genome which, for whatever reason, are completely protected from, almost completely protected from mutation. And it was kind of supported by the fact that most UCNEs were found in so-called gene deserts. These are regions of uh, up to a megabase where no coding regions were found. Now, the most uh, plausible hypothesis, uh, in my view, is the mild, is that mild phenotypes, this di uh, they have mild, uh, a mild 
phenotype despite stringent requirements. You know, you could imagine an enzyme that requires almost uh, 100% amino acid conservation to function, but actually is not very uh, important for us. And this is so, so it, it, yeah, basically you would assume that just any mutation would abolish the function, but this wouldn't do much harm, but a little bit uh, harm to the, to the individual. And uh, there will be a phenotype, but a phenotype that is extremely difficult to, to detect in, in the lab. So I do not know whether these mice have been tested, whether they could recognize a cat, for instance. But that could be a survival relevant capability. So hypothesis, one has been ruled out by allele frequency analysis. There are a few uh, variations, and these variations, they have never 50-50% uh, uh, distribution of the alleles. So there are substitutions, but they are kept in the human population at an extremely low frequencies. Now, uh, the hypothesis too is entirely plausible and supported by early uh, population genetic models, which show that even very m mutations with a very mild reduction, reduction in fitness will eliminate it from the population over time, unless the population is really very small. So that is not the problem for population geneticists. And uh, the redundancy hypothesis is basically, uh, uh, which I didn't uh, elaborate before, uh, is that there are multiple copies of such elements which uh, carry out the same function. They are sequence-wise dissimilar, so we don't see parallels. Uh, and so, obviously, with one left, you wouldn't see a phenotype. And th there were speculations because, actually, it's because these elements are so important that uh, individuals do need to copy, so otherwise it would be too ris risky and uh, it would maybe not good for the survival of the species. I think these are arguments which are totally non-Darwinistic, and uh, so I, I, I won't... Uh, say much more. I think, so hypothesis three lacks theoretical support and in addition redundancy is not a well-defined concept because sometimes people speak of functional redundancy but that's a different story to uh, uh, evolutionary redundancy. Okay, so. so this was the resolution of the paradox, kind of. Finally, uh, people identified uh, a phenotype. It's in one uh, case, uh, actually, the, the mice are smaller. They are not, they are still viable. And in another case, they have a lower neuron density. And interestingly, they also cooperate. In, in one case, neural density is further reduced by uh, the knockout of the element which makes mouse smaller. So just this is the reason, actually. It's the region which I showed you before. Um, so uh, the, all this motivated me to try to approach some of the questions with evolutionary simulations. And such simulations, I think, are pretty powerful. Uh, they have a number of advantages. They are easy to explain to people which are not very mathematically minded. You know, it's easy to understand. And even for mathematicians, uh, we can do simulation cases where analytical treatment is just not possible. And also, they, like a mathematical model, they allow for a precise definition what we mean with a term like redundancy. You know, what this, how this would actually play out in a, in a uh, Darwinian evolutionary uh, scenario. The three questions I, I uh, approached was, is mild phenotype compatible with ultraconservation? Can perfect redundancy be maintained? 
uh, in evolution and whether potentially overlapping transcription factor sites could explain ultra conservation. So this is this is just the outline of the of the simulation. It's in essence a genetic algorithm which is often used in machine learning and is much not so often used in evolutionary studies. So we have a diploid population, uh, we compute fitness for individuals, then they multiply or die. Then we, we, we in what you may call germ cell precursor cells, we apply crossover and mutation, produce gametes, mate, and produce new diploid individuals. This is uh, the, I lost here. So I lost something in this slide. No, it disappeared. Um, so the population model, these are technical details. I work with 100 individuals, all initially identical. The genomes have one or two chromosomes, one uh, gene per chromosomes, DNA alphabet lengths, only 20 uh, bases. As the general coding model, you, we use the position weight matrix. That's a model which is uh, commonly used to define the specificity of transcription factor binding sites. And it's a probabilistic model which assigns an occurrence probability of each base at each position of a fixed length DNA region. Uh, fitness is, is, uh, is partially uh, dominant. And in case of full dominance, we just uh, use the, uh, the, the best of, of the two genes. Ah, okay, here I got the sequence logo representation of the, of the PWM, which is uh, visually more uh, uh, um, uh, intuitive. So uh, during the simulation, I collect some uh, Summary statistics for reporting. So the initial population structure represented by, again, by a position specific uh, uh, matrix, which would, I, which would just show the, the occurrence of a certain base in the population. We expect this to be pretty uh, homogeneous. Uh, conservation, which means the average similarity between chromosomes from the final. Uh, from the current, from the initial and the current uh, populations. And variation would be the differences between a random pair from the current, from the current population and fitness, I report the average fitness of the diploid individuals of the current population and also the final population structure. So this is the first experiment, the viability paradox. On the left side, I use a model where the sequence retry requirements or the code models is extremely stringent. There are very, very small letters at the bottom, but you won't see them. And on the right side is a model. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, the phenotype is mild. And on the right side, there is a model where it's, it's degenerate. It allows a lot of variation. But the phenotype of the knockout uh, function is very severe. And I'm just was wondering what would happen after 10,000 iterations. And these are the summary statistics. They are not so different. It's, I have to say I should have run the simulation probably for a longer time. But on the left side, that you see that the conservation, meaning the, the, the degree of similarity of the current population from the initial, stays at the top and so does fitness. And the variability is, is not zero. Eh? That's, and on the right side, we see uh, the, the fitness has a little bit more variability, but stays at the top also. It's conserved the function. But we see that the conservation drops a little bit. And you know maybe one or two substitutions have happened during the course. So you can see this in the... In the uh, outcome at the bottom. So on the left side, it's precisely uh, identical. Uh, on the right side, you, you see one clear substitution of a G uh, into a T. That's probably the only thing that happened. 
I do think it's a little bit disappointing, but uh, basically the the point is shown that it's not it's not the severity of the phenotype; it is the stringency of the model which decides whether sequences would uh, uh, drift away. And the second simulation is is the redundant. So here I. Uh, here it's just two genes which are supposed to do uh, the same functions. They have a severe phenotype, and uh, we just let them evolve. The, uh, the fitness will be defined by the fitter of the two genes. So, and what you see here, I have, I have, uh, uh, I have four genes. You know, is are in the game. The fitness is on individual is on individuals. So what you see there is one of the two genes rapidly diverges. And this same gene also has somewhat within population variability. And I think that is what I expected. You know, if you, if you have two genes, you don't need two genes. And once a gene has a mutation, it, gets the it will fade away, as in the genes that get lost after the fished applications, the coding genes. And yeah, that you see that the, the, the redundant gene 2, which has now, uh, uh, which, which has drifted away, has several, I think, four substitutions, which we can e easily find, identify in the lower right corner. So last simulation, overlapping TF binding site. Um, uh, this, so the, the rationale is that uh, TF binding site are highly degenerate. And the sequence logos on the left side, you see the so sequence logos of three transcription factor binding sites from the Jasper database. You see they, they look a little bit like the, the model I showed you before. Now, uh, the, what made me think that such a simulation is possible is the fact that a degenerative motif can be obtained uh, by decomposition of uh, stringent PWM into two, two degenerate uh, PWM. So uh, the, the numbers show that if you multiply two PWMs uh, and you normalize the, 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 the rows to, to one, to probabilities, you can get a perfectly, exactly the stringent model I used before. And you can easily reverse the process by just uh, randomly splitting the po probabilities. And below is, is how I have done this. So you see the two logos which resemble each other uh, somewhat, but clearly are not identical. And if you multiply them, you get the stringent type of sequence that we saw on the previous slides. So that's what I constructed. So on the top is a, a 20 uh, uh, base length UCNE model. And I split this into two according to the procedure explained below. And then I split the individual models again into three or in the lower part, two PWMs. And these PWMs, now, P, PPMs, position probability matrices, now they look like the, the, the real Jasper one, you know. You know. Uh, yeah. Those on the left side, you know, they are in that sense. OK, so this is the test I did. I used uh, a series of three uh, adjacent PWMs as the non-overlapping model of the UCNE with a mild phenotype. Uh, and the fitness is just a minimum uh, over the three PWMs. And on the right side, I, I, I used a model where the five uh, PWMs are superposed, overlapping and overlapping fashion. Yeah. 
And I use the same initial populations uh, in, in order to, uh, to initiate iteration. And here is what, you, what comes out. What you see is that if you have non-overlapping binding sites, typical, typical for human transcription factors, uh, the sequence drifts away. You know, the, the conservation drops from 100% to 90% over 100 iterations. But with the overlapping binding site, it stays at the top. There is no divergence. So actually, uh, this could work. So this is the, just the, the, you, you see the models that were obtained. On, on, the, on the right side, you have some substitutions. Uh, and on the, on, the, on the left side, you have some substitutions. And on the right side, uh, it's perfectly conserved. So these are the conclusions. Ultra conservation doesn't require a strong phenotype. A basic redundancy model cannot explain ultra conservation. And overlapping TF binding sites can explain ultra conservation. So special thanks to two persons who inspired me. One is my PhD su su supervisor, uh, Ed Trifonov who introduced me to overlapping DNA codes and uh, also to the, to the view of DNA as a language. And really an uh, exceptional, wonderful PhD student, uh, Slavica Dimitrieva, who created the UCNE base, which is, quite, which is quite well used, and really did a fantastic study on US UCNEs, which I didn't tell about today. Regarding the functionality of these regions, uh, as they are very important in the developing uh, organism, would you say they function as a, a chromosome or genomic opening, so is uh, easier for the mechanisms, the replicases to, uh, and the uh, uh, RNA uh, replicates to identify and uh, translate the, uh, the transcript the message of these genes that are associated with uh, uh, with the development. If I'm, uh, we can start by that. Well, maybe not, but I think we have to distinguish uh, kind of two levels. You know the. The molecular level, which we just don't know, you know, it's we are, it's it's just impossible to do any meaningful research which would really tell us something. You know, you can do report reported gene assays, but these elements operate as clusters. You cannot put a, a, a cluster into a, a into a reporter construct. So the other uh, question. Is is at the, you know, is, is the master regulator functions? No, that would be compatible with opening, but opening would only be one mechanism. But then, in this case, is you know these G, these elements manage to correctly open or close or activate the gene in thousand different cells, cell types during the development in an extremely precise manner and in response to lots of external signals, especially signals like positional information in an embryo, contacts with other cells and all, all that kind. So that's, they could be opening, that could be direct bind, binding to an uh, to an activating transcription factor. But I think just if they, because if they have to correctly regulate the master regulator under thousands, if not millions different conditions, that would be the overload of function, of constraints they, they have. That's figure. Yeah. Welcome. 
about 30 years ago, uh, uh, there was a popular thesis that um, non-coding regions have a sort of clear text form and the coding regions of the coded text. Uh, in that context, of course, th there was some disputes about whether we can recode those texts and trace them in coded regions se sequences. Uh, have you met any progress in in, in in that context? Because for some time I haven't seen those. There were analyses by Stanley and his groups about differences in text structures of coding and non-coding regions. Do you think that there exists a possibility uh, that recoding those text parts of uh, uh, parts of the genome you are speaking about could be traced perhaps in some axon regions? Well, what do you mean by recoding in this context? Uh, because linguistic investigations show that non-coding regions has the form of clear text, while the coding regions have uh, uh, frequent uh, uh, for, uh, um, for, uh, characteristics of a coded text uh, scripts. Well, I, uh, I, I, I don't really know, but what I can say is that, I mean, people have done Markov analysis, mm -hmm. uh, and there are uh, there are clear differences uh, in in the sense that in in uh, in coding mm -hmm. regions, for instance, if you go to the amino acid level, there is not much nearest neighbor dependency, a kind of disappointingly uh, uh, low. Whereas in these in these uh, non coding regions. The, there is mark of then dependencies over six, ten base pairs, a little bit the, the size the, the, of that the could be, That could be in line with those yeah, older so, uh, textual analysis of... Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. That's still valid, but it didn't bring us closer to understand, to understand the code. So to, it, yeah. it, okay, thank you. So, Professor, thank you very much. Thank you.